Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start talking about subterrace transceivers in silicon. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I received my PhD from the University of Tokyo in 1993, and in the same year, I became an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo. From 1998 to 2000, I was a visiting professor at the ESAT Micas Laboratory of the Catholic University of Leuven. Since 2009, I am a professor at Hiroshima University. I was a distinguished lecturer at SSCS from 2011 to 2012 and a member of the RF subcommittee of ISCCC from 2015 to 2019. I was the chair of the Chapter, chapter Operations Committee of IEEE Japan Council from 2017 to 2018. I was the general chair of IEEE Radio Frequency Integration Technology in 2020. My recent research interests are in low power millimeter wave and subterrace wireless CMOS circuits. Here is the content of today's talk. First, I will give an overview of subterrace communications. Next, I will describe a 300-year CMOS transceiver. Finally, we will discuss the future of subterrace communications. First, let's talk about the background of subterrace communications. This figure plots the evolution of date rates for wireless and wired communications. The gray line shows the evolution of wired communications and the black and red lines show the evolution of wireless communications. The date rate of wired communication has been increasing at the rate of 10 times in seven and a half years. On the other hand, the date rate of wireless communication has evolved at the rate of 10 times in four years. In other words, the date rate evolution of wireless communication is much faster than that of wired communication. As a result, by the year 2020, wireless communication has reached a date rate of 100 gigabits per second at the laboratory level. If it continues to evolve at this rate, the date rate of wireless communication will catch up with the date rate of wired communication by 2030. However, it is unlikely that the date rate of wireless communication will overtake that of wired communication. Eventually, the maximum date rate per carrier will be almost the same for wired and wireless communications. This figure shows the frequency domain of electromagnetic waves. The area of the left is radio waves, and the area on the right is light. The date rate of wireless communication has been improving with increasing carrier frequency. Recently, it has reached the terrace region which is between radio waves and light. Among these, the 300 years band has been attracting attention in recent years. The figure shown here is the frequency allocation of the 300 years band. The frequencies from 252 years to 275 years were allocated to mobile and land fixed wireless communications. Until recently, Frequencies above 275 years have not been allocated for use. At the two, uh, 2019 World Radio Communication Conference, the region from 275 years to 296 years has, was identified for wireless communications. As a result, a total of 44 years frequency band from 252 years to 296 years is now available for wireless communication. This is the reason why ultra high speed communication is expected to be realized in the 300 years band. Discussions about beyond 5G and 6G have started in various countries. This figure shows the technical direction of Beyond 5G as presented by NTT Docomo in Japan. One direction is ultra-high date rates. It is expected that the 300 years band will be used for ultra-high date rates. The other direction is extreme coverage. Beyond 5G, services are expected to expand the sky, sea, and space. 
However, if you look at closely at the diagram, you can see that the extreme coverage is expected in the frequency band below millimeter wave. And the service range in the 300 years band seems to be limited. The ultimate goal of wireless communication to achieve ultra high date rates and the extreme coverage simultaneously. I would like to consider whether such a thing is theoretically possible. In order to discuss the transmission distance of wireless communication, it is necessary to consider the required receiving power. This figure shows the schematic of the frequency bands for wireless communication in the microwave and subterrace bands. The frequencies are written on a log scale, so naturally the bandwidth of subterrace band is much wider than that of the microwave band. Therefore, based on the Shannon Hadley theory, the communication capacity in the subterrace band is much larger than the microwave band. Does this lead to the possibility of acquiring infinite communication capacity if we keep increasing the carrier frequency? In order to consider this issue, we must think about the required receiving power. Now let's take a closer look at the relationship between frequency bands and the communication capacity. The communication capacity, or the maximum data rate C, can be expressed as B multiplying by log 1 plus signal to noise ratio from Shannon Hartree theorem. Here, B is the frequency band. Let's apply this to wireless communication. The signal power S can be replaced by the received power PR. The noise power N can be obtained by KTB times NF, where K is Boltzmann's constant, T is the absolute temperature, and the NF is the noise figure of the receiver. This equation can be further approximated in this way, when B is large or small. When b is small, we can ignore the 1 in parentheses. So we can approximate it as in this equation. The frequency band b appears twice in this equation, but the b contained in the log function varies less than the b outside the log function. So in this region, c is almost proportional to b. On the other hand, when b, b becomes very large, b disappears and C becomes proportional to the received power PR. In other words, if the received power PR is constant, C will hit the ceiling, even if B is widened. The relationship between frequency band and the channel capacity is shown in the graph. It is plotted for three cases, 0.1 microwatt, 1 microwatt, and 10 microwatt received power. From this figure, we can see that the, when the frequency band is small, channel capacity is proportional to the frequency band. But when the frequency band is large, it approaches the maximum value of the channel capacity determined by the received power. In the 300 years band, 252 years to 296 years can now be used for wireless communication. And in WRC 2019, 356 years to 450 years are also specified for wireless communication. Therefore, the technology target for the next 10 years will be around 10 GHz frequency band. This figure shows the relationship between RF bandwidth and the signal to noise ratio for three cases of, of 0.1 microwatt, 1 microwatt, and 10 microwatt received power. For the same received power, the signal to noise ratio decreases in inverse proportion to the RF bandwidth. In this figure, the signal to noise ratio required for a bitrate rate of 10 to the minus third power is shown by the red line for QPSK, 60 qm, and 64 qm. This figure shows that only QPSK can meet the red required signal to noise ratio even in the 25 GHz RF band. 
If we want to achieve 100 GHz RF band, we need at least 1 microwatt of received power. So far, we have seen that sufficient receiving power is required to expand the bandwidth. Now it is time to consider the communication distance in subterrace communication. One of the factors that reduce the residual power is atmospheric attenuation. This figure shows the atmospheric attenuation from the millimeter wave band to the terahertz band. You can see the atmospheric attenuation becomes larger as the frequency increases. The orange line in the middle of the figure indicate that the atmospheric attenuation becomes 10 dB at 1 km. Beyond this line, it becomes difficult to communicate in the kilometer range. The frequencies are 60 GHz, 183 GHz, 325 GHz, and all frequency above 360 GHz. Fortunately, however, the 300 years band from 252 GHz to 296 GHz has relatively low atmospheric attenuation. The figure on the right shows the communication distance in terms of frequency and atmospheric attenuation. The communication distance is calculated based on the distance where the atmospheric attenuation is 10 dB. The communication distance between 252 GHz and 296 years is more than 3 km. If it rains, the atmospheric attenuation becomes larger, but if the weather is fine, the effect of atmospheric attenuation is relatively small at 300 years band. On the other hand, the propagation loss, which is the ratio of received power to the transmitted power, is also related to the frequency. This is freeze propagation formula, where PR is the received power, PT is the transmitted power, GT and GR are the gains of transmitting and receiving antennas respectively. Lambda is the wavelength and D is the communication distance. In this formula, lambda is in the numerator, which means that the smaller lambda is, the smaller the received power becomes as the frequency increases. If the antenna gain is fixed, it indicates that the received power becomes smaller as the carrier frequency increases. On the other hand, the antenna gain is inversely proportional to the square of the wavelength lambda if the effective antenna area is the same. Therefore, the antenna gain increases in proportion to the square of the frequency. Substituting this equation into the above equation, we get this equation. Here, the effective antenna area is used instead of the antenna gain. This equation is the one given in Free's original paper. In this equation, lambda appears in the denominator. Therefore, if the antenna area is constant, the received power will increase as the carrier frequency increases. Let's transform Free's equation by using the equivalent isotropic residual power EIRP, which is given by the product of the transmit power and the transmit antenna gain. If we transport the transmit power from the Free's equation to the right side, we get this equation. This equation can be rewritten using EIRP. Furthermore, the gain GR of the received antenna is given by this equation using the effective area AR of the receiving antenna. Here, AR divided by the square of the communication distance is the solid angle omega of the receiving antenna as seen from the transmitter. In other words, the received power is obtained by the multiplying the ERP by the solid angle omega and dividing by 4 pi. This formula is independent of wavelengths. In other words, the carrier frequency and propagation loss are essentially unrelated. Therefore, if the bandwidth is the same, long distance communication is possible even at subterrace. 
However, widening the frequency band will affect the transmission distance because the signal to noise ratio will be degraded. To increase the IRP, the antenna gain needs to be increased. Here, increase the antenna gain narrows the beam width. Therefore, the beam direction needs to be controlled. To control the beam direction electrically, a phase array is used. In a phased array, the beam direction is changed by controlling the phase of parallel transmitters and receivers. In general, digital signal processing is required. If there are n transmitters in parallel, the antenna gain and output power will both be n times higher. Thus, the small output power, which is a problem when using a CMOS, can be solved. Here is an example of the phase array where a transmitter with an output power of 1 mW and a radiator with an antenna gain of 7 dBi are used as the transmitter and the receiver. In the case of 2x2 parallel, the output power is 4 mW and the antenna gain is 13 dBi, which is not very large. However, in the case of 128 by 128, the transmit power is 16 watt and the antenna gain reaches 50 dBi. In a phased array, the antennas are spaced about half a wavelength apart. Since the wavelength of 300 GHz is 1 mm, the spacing is 500 micron. Thus, even a 128 by 128 phase array would be less than 10 cm in size. On the other hand, in order to have a 500 micron pitch array, the transceivers must be also that size. If such a small transceiver can be realized, it will bring us closer to the practical use of Tabtera CMOS transceivers. The figure on the left shows the relationship between the number of elements in the phase array and the communication distance. With a 2x2 two two phase array, the communication distance is only 50 cm. However, with a 128 by 128 phase array, the communication distance reaches 100 km. This is comparable to the distance from the ground to the low Earth's orbit satellite. The figures on the right show the relationship between the number of elements in the phase array and the half power beam width. For a 2 by 2 phase array, the half power beam width is 28 degrees, so there is no need to precise beam control. However, for a 128 by 128 phase array, the half power beam width is 0.4 degrees, so precise beam control is required. If such beam control can be realized, long distance transmission will be possible with subterrace communication. Now we will show some examples of transceivers using CMOS. The first one is a CMOS transmitter. This figure shows an example of a transmitter proposed in the past. The architecture of the transmitter depends on the Fmax. Fmax is the unity gain frequency. If the Fmax is sufficiently high, such as in the case of indium phosphide, the 300 GHz signal is generated by an upconversion mixer and amplified by a power amplifier. On the other hand, in the case of CMOS, Fmax is not high enough to amplify the 300 GHz band. Therefore, a method of using tripla to generate 300 GHz band signal has been proposed. However, there are two drawbacks to using a tripla. One is that not only the center frequency is tripled, but the frequency band is also tripled. Therefore, the spectral efficiency becomes lower. The other is that the modulation scheme is limited to QPSK. For modulation schemes that have both amplitude and phase information, such as 16 quam, the constellation is broken when it passes through the tripla. To be able to support QAM without degrading the spectral efficiency, we need to use an up mixer. 
This slide shows the architecture of our proposed 300 years CMOS transmitter. Here, a square mixer using a doubler as a mixer is used in the final stage. The first stage mixer upconverts the signal to the intermediate frequency and also superimposes an LO signal on the output. The intermediate frequency signal with the LO signal superimposed is amplified and input to the square mixer. In the square mixer, the LO signal and the intermediate frequency signal are multiplied as in a normal mixer to generate the RF signal. The square mixer can support QAM. The output power can also be increased by connecting square mixers in parallel. This slide shows the square mixer in operation. The square mixer is a doubler, so the input signal is squared. The LO signal and the IF signals are combined and input to the square mixer. As a result, LO squared plus 2 times LO IF plus IF squared is generated. This second term is the RF signal. As a result, the square mixer behaves like a fundamental mixer, linearly upconverting the IF signal with the LO signal. However, the square mixer also generates the LO squared and the IF squared at the same time. These signals are unwanted signals and need be removed. To remove the unwanted signals, two paths are provided. One path is generate LO plus IF, and the other is to generate LO minus IF. In the upper path, the square mixer generates LO plus IF squared. In the lower path, the square mixer generates LO minus IF squared. These two signals are input to the balloon. Then LO minus, square, LO minus IF squared is subtracted from LO plus IF squared. As a result, only the desired RF signal remains at the output, and unwanted signals can be removed. The 300 years transmitter was fabricated using a 40 nanometer CMOS process. This transmitter can generate data rate up to 105 gigabit per second when using 32 QAM. The figure on the right shows the constellation and spectrum. Thanks to the LO leak cancer, the LO signal is below the noise floor. Below is the case when 128 QAM is given as the input signal. In this case, by changing the frequency of the LO signal, we can generate six channels of 24.64 gigabit per second RF signal. This result shows the high linearity of the square mixer. The next section describes a 300 years CMOS receiver. A 300 years CMOS receiver cannot use a low noise amplifier, which is commonly used. Therefore, a mixer first architecture is used. The noise figure NF is important for the receiver. In a mixer first architecture, it is important to reduce the noise figure of the mixer. However, the gain of the mixer is less than 1. So we also need to consider the noise figure of the second stage from the Fries noise equation. From this equation, we need to lower the noise figure NF1 of the mixer and the increase the conversion gain G1 as much as possible. The conversion gain of the fundamental mixer can higher than that of the harmonic mixer. Therefore, the fundamental mixer is used in the 300 years CMOS receivers. However, the fundamental mixer requires a LO signal in the 300 years band. It is necessary to generate the 300 years LO signal needed to drive the mixer. However, it is not possible to make the LO driver amplifier in CMOS. Therefore, we need to consider an architecture that does not use the LO driver amplifier. This figure shows the architecture of a 300 years LNLS receiver. The 300 years signal is generated by sextupling the external 50 years LO signal. The 50 years signal is first tripled to 150 years, 
and then amplified and fed to the doublers. By connecting the doublers output in parallel, the output power is increased. The 300 years error signal with the required power is then supplied to the fundamental mixer. The 300 years receiver was fabricated using a 40 nanometer CMOS process. The measurement results of the received signals are shown on the right. It was found that the signals of up to 32 gigabit per second can be received when using C-Sync 1 signals. Finally, we present the one-chip transceiver that integrates the transmitter and the receiver. The frequency band of 252 GHz to 296 GHz has been identified for wireless communication in WLC 2019. On the other hand, IEEE standard 802.15.3D proposes a channel allocation from 252 GHz to 322 GHz. This slide shows some of those channels. The frequency bands shown in gray are frequencies that are not identified for wireless communications in WLC 2019. We have created the transceiver that supports channel 66 in this list. Channel 66 has 12 times the frequency bandwidth of the 2.16 GHz per channel in the 60 GHz band. This slide shows the architecture of a typical transceiver in a very simplified form. The transmitter upconverts the modulated signals and amplifies it. In the receiver, received signal is amplified and downconverted. However, in a 300 GHz CMOS transceiver, not only can neither a power amplifier nor a low noise amplifier be used, but error signals cannot be amplified either. This is because the Fmax of the transistors available in CMOS technology is low. As already explained, we have fabricated the 300 GHz CMOS transmitter and the receiver respectively. These architectures are not very similar. However, to create a single chip transceiver, we need to integrate these architectures. This slide shows the architecture of a single chip transceiver. The top half of this architecture is a transmitter. This transmitter operates as a error driver in the receive mode. The key to integrating the transmitter and the receiver is the rat rate circuit. The rat rate circuit has two outputs, a common mode output and a differential output. By using these different outputs, the transmitter and the receiver are integrated. First, let's start with the transmit mode. In transmit mode, we use two paths as explained in the CMOS transmitter to generate LO plus IF and LO minus IF signals. These signals are input to the square mixer to generate 300 years band signals. The unwanted signals generated in the, this process are suppressed by using the differential output of the rat rate circuit. Next is the explanation of the receive mode. In the receive mode, the baseband signal input in the transmit mode is turned off. Then the first stage mixer output only a low signal. This error signal is amplified and input to the square mixer. The square mixer is the same circuit as the doubler, so the frequency is doubled. In receive mode, the output of the square mixer is power combined by using the common mode output of the rat rate circuit. This power combination generates an error signal with sufficient output power. Using the error signal the fundamental mixer downconverts the received signal. The one chip transceiver was fabricated using a 40 nanometer CMOS process. The circuit is symmetrical, so a total of four square mixers are connected in parallel. This enhances the output power for 300 years signals. This slide shows the experiment of a single chip transceiver. Using the same chip, we fabricate the board 
that operate in transmit mode and another board that operates in receive mode. The carrier frequency is 265.68 GHz, which is channel 66 of IEEE 802.15.3D. A maximum date rate of 80 gigabit per second was achieved when the modulation was 16 quam and the symbol rate was 20 gigabol. The maximum output power of the transmitter is minus 1.6 dBm and the total power consumption of the transmitter and the receiver is 1.8 watt. The lower right shows the constellation and spectrum at 80 gigabit per second. Here is a demonstration video. This project was carried out at Hiroshima University, Panasonic, and NICT. First, here is a demonstration of a 300-year CMOS chip transceiver. This chip was presented at ISCCC 2019. Here is a chip micrograph. This chip has transmit port on the top and a receive port at on the bottom. And four square mixers are connected in parallel using a rat race circuit. For the experiment, we made two evaluation boards, one for transmitting and one for receiving. The evaluation board and antenna were connected using waveguide probe. In this picture, the radio wave travels from left to right. First is a demonstration of 300 years wireless transmission. The display at the back shows the analysis results of the receiver output. We are currently transmitting 16 quam at 20 gigabol, so the date rate is 80 gigabit per second. You can see that the constellation is displayed stably. Next, try blocking the space between transmit and receive antennas with the hand. When an obstacle is inserted, the constellation disappears and the spectrum decreases. In other words, the radio waves are being blocked. In this experiment, a waveguide probe is used, but this is not practical transceiver. So next, I will show the demonstration of the transmitter and receiver modules. The first one is transmitter chip that I talked about. This was presented at ISSC 2017. The next one is the receiver chip. This was presented at IMS 2017. We flip mounted these chips to connect the antenna. A waveguide flange is attached to the, this print, uh, print circuit board. Then we attach the Cassegrain antenna to that waveguide flange. The transmitter is fixed and the receiver is placed on the rail. The initial distance between the transmitter and the receiver is 50 cm. The experiment with this module uses 16 quam and the data rate is 32 gigabit per second. You can see that the constellation is stable when, even when the receiver is up to 1 meter away on the rail. Finally, I would like to discuss the future of subterrace communications. We have talked so far about the high date rate of subterrace communications. However, high speed does not only mean high date rate, it also means low latency. In terms of latency, wireless communication is 50% faster than fiber optic communication. 
This is because the dielectric constant of optical fiber is greater than the dielectric constant of the air. This means that the wireless communication is superior in terms of real-time application. In a real-time application, where real-time is important, 250 million US dollars has been invested in wireless communication between New York and Chicago for high-speed trading. With this real-time capability and high date rates, it will be possible to monitor a distant disaster site in real time from the office. This will be great help in creating a safe and secure life. There are also plans for human activity on the moon. However, the only way to connect the Earth to the moon is through the wireless communication. Subterrors will enable broadband communication at 100 gigabits per second. The distance between the Earth and the Moon is 380,000 kilometers. Theoretically, a transmitter with a power of 10 watt and a parabolic antenna with a diameter of 8 meter can transmit to the Moon. The distance between the Moon and the Earth is 1.3 light seconds so it may not be real-time, but broadband communication with the moon will be theoretically possible. Finally, I would like to consider the technology drivers for communications. The invention of magnetron has made it possible to generate high-power microwaves. As a result, the technology of microwave communication has made great strides since the 1920s. About 50 years later, optical fiber was invented, and optical communication has made great progress since the 1970s. The date rate of optical communication has dramatically increased compared to that of microwave communication. This made it possible to transmit ultra-high speed data over long distance. However, optical communication did not eliminate wireless communication which has different applications. Terahertz is now available to combine the advantages of wire microwave com wireless communication and high-speed optical communication. In the 2020s, Terahertz technology is expected to become a technology driver for communications. Terahertz is an electromagnetic wave between radio wave and light and terahertz communication is expected to bridge the gap between microwave communication and optical communication applications and to play a role in a new high-speed communication that will lead to the sky, sea, and space. Finally, I would like to summarize my talk. The 300 years band using 252 years to 296 years is the target of 6G. The 400 years band using 356 years to 450 years may be the target of 7G. Advances in technology will make terahertz possible for long-distance mobile transmission. The atmospheric attenuation from 100 years to 300 years is relatively small. The resist power derived from ERP and solid angle is independent of the carrier frequency. In 6G, we expect that the communication leading to the sky and space will also exceed 100 gigabits per second. The key to the technology is high-speed baseband processing and precise beam control. Phase arrays are well suited for CMOS integrated circuits. However, 2D scalable will require half-wavelength size transceivers and phase arrays. I expected that the terahertz communication technology will evolve in the 2020s as these technologies are developed. Thank you very much for your attention.